forward slash seed. And there's a link there. You could do that this morning. It's uh, also uh, on the seedambassadors.org. There's, there's a link on the menu for Winter Gardening Guide. Yeah. And if we do update it, it will be there forever updated when we, when we, yeah. when we, we do a we, new yeah. version. We keep meaning to update it. It's been a decade. And we have actually garnered, obviously, as you might think, a fair degree more experience in the last decade or so, particularly with regard to uh, cropping, uh, greenhouse cropping, cropping under cover. We've done a lot more experimenting with that since the guide first came out. Um, okay, so the format for today. Uh, we're going to get to grips with some of the basics and fundamentals relating to crop types and timing and so on and so forth. I think the majority of what we talk about today will address that. And then we'll make a point, I think, towards the end of the discussion, focusing a little bit more on what you might call the more strategic dimensions of uh, raising crops into the Pacific Northwest. We we don't raise crops in isolation. We're growing. Uh, we're trying to create a regenerative food system into the uh, jaws of a larger scientific agricultural complex that is breeding seeds that are fundamentally opposed to that imperative and that impulse. So one of the challenges, for example, that we deal with in terms of endeavoring to build sustainable reproducible, regenerative local food systems is the fact that so many of the crop types and cultivars that we have access to are, um, that that story is very powerfully influenced by these larger social and cultural uh, forces. So one of the things we'll talk about is how we've endeavoured to address that through the years and how we're continuing to try and address that at the local level. All right, so um, kicking things off, um, I'll just start with um, a, a, a brief introduction and then hand over to Andrew. We'll probably play tag team throughout the, uh, throughout the session. Um, oh yeah, please. Um, as far as the format today, I imagine that we're going to do a lot of talking and going through our outlines and talking about some fundamentals or in, orientating everyone to what winter gardening kind of means and what it can be, but, and then talk more about crop types, varieties, maybe more esoteric things, fun practices and tips and tricks. Um, but later on in the process, it'd be nice to open it up to the group and like share stories about how, if anyone here is, has done winter gardening and has certain tips or tricks or stories they want to share or questions that we can answer, but because of the live stream, we probably want to do that in, like, in the second half or later in the process. And also there's some seeds that um, some of us have brought, in, brought, brought today to uh, share uh, in seed swap format, so that'll probably be at the very end, I'm assuming. So, so yeah, that's where we're at. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'll start with my, uh, traditionally I always start with this mantra, which is essentially that I ten we tend to think of the, I tend to think of the fall and winter cropping season as occupying the October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May time frame. In other words, if you are thinking about feeding yourself year round or actually crossing the threshold between playing at it and imagining it, and actually making a serious go of it. Clearly, um, tending to the needs and requirements of feeding yourselves through winter is a critical part of the year-round diet. In fact, it's, as our awareness about the significance of it has deepened through the years, even the, even the name of our workshop is, has, has changed. I mean, remember when we started you know, 20, 20 or so years ago, we used to talk about winter gardening work. Shops, but I mean, I've just put um, leeks, winter leeks in the ground. We have a whole bunch of winter leeks back there that you're uh, uh, transplants that you're free to take. Um, I just put my winter leeks in the ground that I seeded in April. They're going into the ground next to a seed crop of winter leeks that I seeded last March. It's now June of this year. Um, the notion that. Uh, winter cropping or winter gardening is something that fills a particular segment is, is absurd. Basically, we're looking at a crop that I seeded last uh, March or April that was ready to eat last August, August, September, October, November, December, January, 
from Mark Trinkle Me, I mean, in May, eating. It's going to be in the ground for another two, two months as a seed crop. I'm already got the next season's leaks into the mix. So these cycles within cycles are an elemental part of um, the whole cycle. Um, likewise, I had my worst winter cropping season on record this last year. I was, for the first time, raising food into conditions that were particularly shady. Um, there was enough sunlight for me to establish a massive garden heading into the winter, but then as the shade came in, um, my, most of my crops sort of melted um, with the lack of um, sunshine and the disease pressure and so on and so forth. By shade, do you mean overcast? No, I mean shade from trees on both sides. Um, so what, what that meant is that I probably ended up losing 85% of my field crops to disease, um, and, that, and massive losses. So what's, what that's doing is forcing a fundamental reassessment of my winter cropping strategy this season. That kind of uh, happens every year to all of us, as we're always <laughs> messing something up and learning and yeah. changing a few things. And yeah. So, for example, this year I'm looking, obviously, still looking to feed myself through winter, but moving a portion of the crops that were most successful to the sunniest part of the garden, and then devoting my summer garden to more in the way of quinoa, amaranth, corn, potatoes, um, uh, onions, storage onions, and so on and so forth. So really thinking in terms of feeding yourself year-round is a holistic, year-long process that, and, and how it works out at different parts of the year fundamentally affects your strategies into and through winters on either side of it. So I'd just like you to keep that in mind as we move forward and actually start zeroing in on um, the winter uh, period as a whole. You might say, uh, I know that, for example, when we announced that we're doing a winter cropping workshop in early June, a lot of people are taken a little bit by surprise with that. But uh, although we've already seeded our leeks, and for the most part our Brussels sprouts, and so on and so forth, for the most part, our major seeding window for the bedrock of the field crops that are going to be feeding us through the winter in the last two weeks in June. So um, now is an excellent time to be considering um, approaches to that and then obviously securing the seed that you'll need uh, to get that in hand. All right, on that note, would you like to pick up the conversation, old chap? Okay, well, um, just, I don't remember exactly what we introduced ourselves at, but we have been doing these kinds of workshops for over 10 years and often sharing information that a few years later turns out to not quite work anymore. So everything we say is just what, we, what we've learned kind of works most of the time. Um, but I started my winter gardening process as a, as a gardener and, a, and as a farm staff member, like on other farms, trying to figure out how we can do season extension, plant stuff in greenhouses, row covers, how do we get this early stuff to the farmer's market, how do we lengthen the season later into the winter. But once we started our own farm, one of the first things we did was start a winter vegetable CSA. And that was because very few other farms were providing winter vegetables at the time, 10 plus years ago. And that worked out great for a few years until we, um, and until we decided that we, our true love was the seeds and how we wanted to take our seed company, which was a small part of our operation, and make it everything. And now, for many years, we've just been growing and producing seeds, not as much production farming anymore. We do contract a few lots with production farmers to help us with isolation. So we still have that connection to more of a regional, local, organic farm scale um, System. So, so a lot of the recommendations that I bring to the table are often like, how do you grow enough kale to fill some boxes for your CSA, not just like how much kale do, does one family need to grow over winter? Nick is a little bit more tuned to those kinds of, like how do you feed yourself and your, and your community? But that's where I come from, and part of the 
success we had as a vegetable farm was finding varieties that grew really well in our bioregion and produced well over winter on our farm, on our soils, saving seeds, selecting for quality, having more success when you do some seed saving and select better quality plants. And that's why pretty much we are obsessed with seeds is because it was the most interesting thing to us and there was a huge gap, like a lot of need for good quality seeds. Um, later on we'll talk about um, good seed sourcing, which is not just from us. There's a lot of great seed companies out there that produce really good winter quality seeds for winter gardening. You have a quick question? Yeah, uh, you're from Sweet Home Brownsville area? Yes. And you're from Cottage Grover, yeah. just for those tuning in who don't know you. Yes, um, I, uh, Andrew Still is my full name and our seed company is Adaptive Seeds, should live with that. But it's, we're growing in Brownsville Sweet Home area which is a little bit warmer and hotter but also gets a little bit deeper frost because there's not as much of the valley fog where we're at in the winter. So it's an interesting, we have a lot easier time ripening watermelons and people in the valley but sometimes our, our vegetables frost out in the winter a little bit more than a little bit closer to the valley floor where there's more cloud cover during the winter. So it's very microclimate similar, but we're also different. Uh, yeah, and important, uh, I think, to note not simply that, for example, that the um, uh, performance of the seed is uh, uh, shaped greatly by the context in which that seed is developed and increased, but also the um, type of stewardship. Um, a few years ago, I found myself in Northern California in the foothills of the central Sierra Nevada, which has seen a higher increase in temperatures in the last 20 years than any other part of California. Had an area that had no prior history of winter cropping whatsoever. Not because the winters were particularly different from they are in the Northwest, but because crop establishment for winter crops generally takes place in earnest in July and August. And the conditions in that part of the world were so insanely hot and dry that no one had really been able to make it work. But I took down seed from the heart of the holistic plant breeding in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of seed from Andrew, for example, and was able to raise that seed there because it had the capacity to adapt, to settle in. And basically, we were able to completely redefine year-round cropping in a four-county area of the central Sierra Nevadas. That had a lot to do with the quality of the seed that I took down, Oregon seed, and uh, that that the quality of the seed has an enormous amount to do with one's uh, ability to winter crop successfully. Also, the diversity within a variety, but also the diversity of varieties that Nick brought down there. I'm sure there was many seeds from Oregon that do not grow well there, but you were able to find some ones that were like, oh, it's fine, I don't mind. It's great here, too. So it's uh, one of our... Um, obsessions with finding lots of cool new varieties to grow is partly to trial them and see how well they do and what conditions and some of them are not very well tuned to our region and some of them happen to be. And a lot of this winter gardening stuff in the Pacific Northwest started um, at the, kind of the origins, as far as I could trace back, everyone's been growing varieties and growing winter crops, whatever they could figure out. But early on when territorial seed companies started out, uh, is it Steve Solomon? Uh, brought in a lot of seeds from England. One of his seed dealers was, in, was from the UK. He brought a lot of the southern English varieties of like brassicas that happened to grow really well here. And that was kind of one of the things that made Territorial really interesting in the early days was that they had these varieties that grew well in the Pacific Northwest. And we've been to Europe and other countries, other, many other parts of the world collecting seeds over the years and have found that the more you collect, the more likely you'll find something that is amazing. Not everything is good, but you bring stuff in and try on new varieties and new biodiversity, and it's kind of amazing what you find sometimes. And indeed, the Southern Willamette Valley stands on its own right as one of the major global loci for uh, independent public domain plant stewardship. We are essentially the de facto center of global kale diversity in both Russia, Siberian, and European kales, largely due to the works of uh, folk like Andrew and, and other plant stewards locally. 
Um, what that means, for example, is that when, if you began, as we did, uh, winter cropping in this part of the world 20, 25 years ago, there were very few kale varieties that we had available. But the amount of development work that's been done over the course of the last couple of decades means that the um, variety and diversity of material that's available to us, particularly in terms of leaf brassicas, is extraordinary. What that means is not just a, a wonderful increase in terms of quality of diet, in terms of flavours and colours and textures, but it also adds a great deal to the functionality, both in terms of survivability, for example, and in terms of maturity spectrums and so on and so forth. It's one of the reasons we are extremely well placed here to build a resilient local food system. It's possible, frankly, to feed yourself just using kales and collards, in part because of the diversity of material that's both been assembled here and then uh, developed locally too. And uh, you'll probably find us <laughs> speaking a lot to the uh, power of uh, kales and collards in particular. I wouldn't recommend only eating kales and collards. <laughs> I know that's not what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess a, we could start with the base, some basic principles. You want to just like get into some of the fundamental stuff? Yeah, sure. So uh, I kind of broke down before I showed up here a couple categories to think of how to like understand the process of winter cropping is uh, the type of storage, whether or not that's in the outdoor field cooler, like you grew it in the summer and the fall and you're leaving it outside. There's the protected field cooler, which is like a greenhouse or row covers or those kinds of things that are not really like exactly uh, environmentally controlled but are protected in, in some way. There's the indoor cooler, which is usually a walk-in cooler or a root cellar or your refrigerator bottom drawer. Then there's also dry indoor storage which is often summer crops that have been stored for winter consumption. And I, I always like to focus on those, like onions, certain root crops, garlics, other dry crops like winter squash, that, and potatoes, those kinds of roots that are grown in the main production season but are critical for production for winter consumption. That's producing crops for winter. Um, that's, we're not gonna talk as much about those crops today because there's a lot of information about them and it's kind of a, the standard gardening style is to grow those things. But if we want to take questions about how to store stuff and at the end we can get into that. But then another category to think about is what type of weather and season are you dealing with? How cold is it? How wet is it? Uh, are you trying to eat stuff in the early wi winter, the late fall, middle winter? going further into the winter, or even into the hunger gap of spring, which is a critical phrase to remember. The hunger gap is the time between when all of your, your onions and your potatoes are starting to go bad in storage, but all your summer crops haven't really started to kick in yet, and all you have to eat is radishes and arugula, and you're like, was there anything else to eat in the spring? It's the hunger gap, which uh, a lot of that is prepared. We found ways to prepare for that time by uh, growing certain winter crops and then eating them during the hunger gap. Um, one example might be overwintering cauliflower, where it takes almost a year to produce the plant and it finally heads up in May, <laughs> which is right when you want something to eat, but it's uh, a long wait, a lot of planning for those, some of those crops. Uh, there's also, so we're, we're gonna get into the different plant families which are the different types of plant crops or plant families to understand like if I am only planting brassicas, the, that cabbage family crop, like maybe I need something else in my garden too for biodiversity, for flavor, for maybe rotations. There's lots of reasons to have more than just brassicas in your garden. And then also we'll, we can nerd out about varieties, which ones we've found we like for what reasons later, because that's what we really like to talk about. Yeah, and I, you hear us talking quite a lot about brassicas, for example. For the most part, when we talk about brassicas, we're talking about um, uh, kales, European and Russian Siberian kales, collards, 
uh, fallen over wintering cabbages, fallen over wintering cauliflowers, fallen over wintering broccolis, um, Brussels sprouts, corn rabbits, so on and so forth. Um, one of the reasons we um, focus so heavily on brassicas is because they do so well for us. Um, they have the winter hardiness, they have the size, they have the diversity, a whole range of crop types. Present some challenges, obviously, in terms of um, uh, managing nutrition and rotating crops from year to year to year if you have such a heavy focus on them, but we generally find that they're absolutely critical to it. Likewise, as we're moving more fully into experience with cropping inside uh, greenhouses under cover of late, we find that whereas we focus very heavily on the Brassica oleraceae family to a degree and, and Brassica napis outside, inside the greenhouses we focus very heavily on the Asian brassicas, the brassica wrappers. And we'll talk a little bit about that, um, about that, uh, uh, about that dimension uh, a little later. But one of the things to, uh, definitely to keep in mind is that I remember you were mentioning to me just um, a few days ago when you were chatting, Andrew, that you took stock of the number of different crop types that you were offering in your winter CSA relative to your summer CSA. You were offering more crop types in the winter than you were in the summer. Um, for those of us who have a good deal of experience raising food year round, we actually do realize that in the winter uh, is actually when the food is spectacular. We have a dizzying array of, uh, to choose from. And of course, one thing to keep in mind is that one of the ways plants defend themselves from the cold is essentially by pumping themselves full of nature's equivalent of antifreeze, which is sugars. Everything gets sweeter. Everything tastes better. Uh, for example, if you've only ever eaten a carrot out of a store or a summer carrot, and you've never eaten a winter carrot, you really haven't tasted what carrots can taste like. I mean, it's truly, it's very, it's very significant. So we're not just talking about um, uh, quality of food, nutrient density, um, healthfulness of fresh local food, but the beauty of life itself, as you really begin to move into these, um, uh, growing these crops year round, particularly through winters, uh, life really does take on a much deeper qualitative aspect for the, for the fact that you're raising and eating food out of local soils. So we're going to talk mostly about the, the type of outdoor uh, crops that are left in the field over winter and maybe sometimes brought in in certain circumstances. Uh, one of the things we like to say is that the, the Willamette Valley's winter season is just like one great giant refrigerator that the, uh, the, the pests and diseases and rodents and stuff can also get into sometimes. <laughs> but it is a, like you plant it, you size it up and hopefully by the time it gets really cold, that's, it's like in stasis almost. And, one of the critical parts is planning for how much do I want to eat. You're going to probably have way too much food going into the fall and then not quite enough in the winter and then way too much in the spring again. Because if you're trying to grow as much, it's like you want to eat a kale smoothie every day all winter long, you're going to need like a quarter acre of kale in the middle of winter to, to actually get, get there. Because it, the plants tend to stop growing and just hold until it starts warming up again and they start growing more. So there's a little bit of um, a concern as far as that outdoor refrigerator. It's not necessarily thought of as a growing season because things aren't always growing. Uh, but if you do put a little bit of like a hoop house with like an open ends with the, some plastic just to keep the rain off and to hold a little bit of that heat, all it takes is that and stuff will just start growing like it's springtime. So that's a, uh, there's a lot of these little things that we can do to, to encourage the plants to grow. Um, if you don't have as much space as like a, like a, a farm that has a couple acres of, to, to plant crops in, you probably want to consider protecting your field, your crops, either with row covers or with uh, some hoop house kinds of things. Uh, because you will get twice as much food out of that space, especially in the middle of winter. And that's, uh, that's the, kind of uh, the, the basics of that um, outdoor refrigerator. And that is all related to the weather and the season. And sometimes certain crops, you'll, you'll have a crop like a kale, like a lacinato kale that you really loved, 
and it happens to be that one out of eight years where it doesn't stop raining for a single day in January, and the lost amount of kale rots out and dies because it just has the wet feet are just too wet. And you're like, oh, I, 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 a lost amount of kale was 90% of my diet. I didn't realize that it could just die like that. It was so great for the last eight years. So we like to encourage having several different types of plants in order to avoid those kinds of one-off weather events. Uh, a classic example, I, I mentioned that I'd lost probably um, 80 to 85 percent of my uh, field brassicas to disease and rot this winter. Two of my mainstay uh, cultivars, I've trialed scores of different uh, leaf brassica cultivars through the decades, and uh, my cropping systems have actually become simpler in recent years as I've really begun to zero in on the crops I consistently find that, and varieties that I find that really work for me. So I'm really um, uh, focus on, on that more than I do the um, experimental side of things. And I found that my two mainstay leaf brassica varieties just disappeared. But I had enough diversity in the garden so that it didn't matter that much. Yes, typically I'd be feeding local food banks and local food benches with lots and lots of food, but I had enough to feed myself quite well, simply because I had the diversity there uh, to handle those changes. And typically what we find is that every year is different. Um, you know, different fall weather, different midwinter lower, different midwinter weather, different spring weather, and so on and so forth. And you'll find that um, the performance of plants and set different cultivars uh, uh, it reflects uh, the, uh, the changing conditions of each year. So always we're looking to, uh, to rely on diversity, not just for adding, as I said, to the uh, uh, quality of the diet, but also very much in terms of the survivability of what of, of the crops in the fields too. Yeah, and the weather has been getting more unpredictable, a little bit more extreme, or luckily moderated by our weather patterns from most, a lot of the ex, like super extreme changes that are happening. But it's there's always been every couple years there's something new, or every year there's something small that's new, and it's it's getting more predictable that that's going to keep happening and happening. But because of that, relying on only a few crops is um, not advised. And we always, we like to stress that we promote biodiversity in variety choice, but that's partly um, manifested in the fact that we only sell or produce or grow uh, open pollinated varieties, which is, an, is a, in contrast to hybrid varieties. Most seed companies sell a majority of hybrid seed because it's the most um, predictable um, and uniform and vigorous plant seed on the market for a lot of these for a lot of farmers to plant because they want to plant one big bed of cabbage or a field of cabbage and have them all head up on the same day and on like on a predictable day and then harvest them all and send them to the market. Like we're not as interested in those things as gardeners or small growers because we want stuff to kind of have flexibility and have an ability to adapt and those inbred type hybrid seed are really good at what they do, but they're only like a one trick pony. They do not adapt to different conditions. Uh, a lot of them have been bred for the production regions around the world, such as like the coast of California. So if your climate shifts out of that, uh, that kind of uh, temperate, mild climate, those hybrids sometimes don't produce well. But if you have an open pollinated variety, which is what like heirlooms, a lot of people call them, even though not all heirlooms are, not all open pollinated plants are heirlooms, so it's not exactly the same. But it's, we like to have open pollinated plants that are more like a population of cross pollinating uh, diverse plants. So one of the things that we're very known for is the Kale Coalition, which we brought back 14 varieties of Oleracea kale from Europe and Nick, and I was like, I'm just gonna find a couple that I like and I'm gonna trial them all and see which ones I really like and I'll grow those out. And Nick said, but what do we do with all of the ones we don't like? like so he crossed them all together. And now we have this huge population of like 14 varieties of kale from, that's just kind of chaos at this point. 
but if the weather changes, there's somebody in that group of kales that's going to be perfectly happy. And I should stipulate that when, when I first crossed that population back in the winter, I think of 2008, and began growing the seed ad, um, it, 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 was a, it was a rather, um, as you said, sort of chaotic population. But it's been stewarded through the years and has continued to interbreed through the years. When I went down to California, it was one of the populations I took down with me. And the seed that I got was the latest iteration, of the latest stewardship iteration. One of the things that was absolutely spellbinding to me was that it was a very, very, very different population from the uh, first iteration that, uh, uh, we'd, that, that, that resulted from our first save on it. It had been stewarded consistently through the decades, and the qualities that uh, we appreciate had been called forth, and the ones that we didn't like had been let go. And it had also continued to further adapt to local soils and local conditions. So it completely transformed into an absolute bioregional powerhouse. This is essentially what it means to adapt your food and adapt your f to, to, to local life. Um, it's one of the powers of open pollinated seed that hybrids simply completely lack the capacity to do. In fact, they're fundamentally designed not to be able to do that. Uh, so, the, the story of the kale being grown in California is very interesting because in California they've had extreme weather variability for, and it's getting really bad. So if there's anything to learn from that scenario, if it get even a more extreme weather variability here, we can think ahead a little bit and maybe prepare ourselves for such changes. And that's open pollinated plants are like kind of what nature had always existed in the wild is open pollinated plants that have a that can adapt to the climate most of the time. Sometimes things go extinct naturally, but usually those plants can change and slowly move around and adapt and to a new changing environment. And we are crossing a lot of these things together in order to be able to do it faster and uh, more resiliently. And, but it's also a little bit awkward to have every single plant be different. Every single plant ripens on a different day. It's really great if you're a small grower or a gardener because all your kale isn't ripe on the same day or those kinds of things. Which, so there's, there's benefits and drawbacks to all of these um, ways of interacting with the garden environment. Yeah, I think Andrew was speaking quite interestingly there too. You, you might say the power of uh, the homestead garden. One of the things that we're finding, particularly as we move into erratic weather conditions, is that gardeners are actually better placed to deal with these challenges than, for example, corporate farmers. I remember some, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, we had a minus 10 degree weather event in Eugene. That's uh, 40 degrees below zero. We had a sense the temperature was going to go down to about zero, and I got on local social media and basically said, look, I've never taken my greenhouse or field crops down to this temperature level before. Does anybody have any advice? And there was a whole slew of people from the Midwest piped up and said, throw the towel in, mate. You're going to lose it all. Um, I decided not to. I mean, one of the things that distinguishes, for example, temperatures in the Midwest is that when they go down, they stay down. Whereas in this part of the world, we get temperatures that go down, but then they tend to bounce up again relatively quickly. It's when it's it's consecutive, repeating, uh, hard nighttime freezes that work cumulatively, basically, in terms of knocking the stuffing out and eventually killing a crop. But if you can basically get a crop through a challenge like that, you can make it work. So what I was able to do, basically, just with a, a, a small greenhouse on a little piece of land in Eugene, uh, it was 30 foot by 9 foot uh, home-built greenhouse, we've basically got the plans to put those up relatively inexpensively was able to basically bring a greenhouse through a minus 10 degree weather event, whereas m the vast majority of farmers in the bio region completely lost all their crops, and many of them lost their greenhouses too. Um, a, a friend locally um, actually got his uh, f lawn furniture out and covered his crops with tables and then sleeping bags on top of it. 
and uh, and got his crops through that way. And uh, you know, we might think that that's somewhat risible, um, that that sort of approach. But he was eating fresh local food for months after all the local farmers had lost all of theirs. And it's that sort of small scale folksy approach that actually has an extraordinary degree of ecological power. It's one of the reasons why Wally Vaya, a pillar of the local Badalaric farming community, uh, long ago said that he thinks the future farming is in the hands of the gardeners, particularly as we head into climate chaos. We're finding that homestead level, small scale, folksy, flexible approaches to stewarding crops and protecting them is actually the most ecologically resilient way forward. So some of the, we've touched on the challenges of climate and the weather is, I like to break it down into wet, cold, and dark. Those are the things that we're struggling against in the winter. And a lot of people think, how hardy is this crop? Can it go through winter at this low level of temperature? And I often say, well, that's only a very small part of the equation. Hardiness is one important bit, but it's, it almost doesn't matter if it's raining for weeks on end. And your garden bed, it doesn't have very good drainage. Uh, so something like a lettuce, as an example of this, a lot of lettuces are very, very cold hardy. And you would never know because they're always sliming out and dying in the garden. And that's almost entirely because of the combination of wet and dark and related to wet airflow. Because if there's not enough airflow around these plants, a lot of bacteria and funguses and pests get in there and start just like going at this plant that's stressed out. And once lettuce gets infested with a bunch of fungus, it just goes down. It's not that resistant or resilient to um, diseases. And the wet and the airflow is often way more substantial than the cold. So a lot of growers that have a greenhouse will just leave the ends of the greenhouse open and just plant the whole thing in lettuce for the winter and the lettuce will be fine all winter because it's keeping <coughs> the rain off and also letting lots of air flow to blow through. And occasionally you get a hard snap, a hard cold snap that will take out lettuces or damage them and they'll lose quality. But it's often the wet that is more important for, uh, as a challenge to those weather, like the weather challenges for those crops. Yeah, I, uh, uh, very good point there. Um, typically when we raise crops in greenhouses through winters, we leave the ends open constantly. We'll uh, um, close them up if we head into a particularly harsh weather event and maybe even throw some propane heat in there if things get particularly harsh and, and lay down floating row cover, which are these sort of uh, agricultural, this white agricultural fabric that can land several degrees of protection. But for the most part, um, uh, air circulation and dryness can be to the great uh, 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 um, qualitative differences you can make in terms of getting food through winters, yes? So then you walk and water in the really no, there's really no, There's really no need to do it. Typically once you get your crops established into a greenhouse in the winter, I'm not watering at all. Now we might, you might get a hot dry spell at some point, say for example, it used to be for example that every February without fail we would get a week of hot weather and everybody cycling around in shorts and t-shirts and so forth, but it's been about five or I don't know, seven or eight years since that sort of habit sort of ended. Um, but for the most part, you're not needing to water your winter crops once you've got them established in the greenhouse. And if it is a smaller greenhouse, there's a lot of water coming off the greenhouse and kind of coming up under yeah. a little bit of dampness inside in the soil is usually enough. Yeah. Uh, if uh, you dig around and it's bone dry and cracking and super arid, you can then, I would recommend using some drip irrigation in that situation yeah. in order to keep the moisture off the leaves, unless the leaves are all dusty and sad and you want to wash them. but. The, uh, it's like, all of this stuff is related. So it's kind of hard to just like talk about it linearly. So we might be bouncing around a bunch. But like the, the problem with this lettuce situation is like they need that moisture in the soil, usually it's there. 
um, if you've established the plants over like and but you don't want to water it so it gets super damp and wet and that's an airflow kind of just managing disease is the whole point of that and as an, there's an example of like if you take like the classic like cutting like that big giant bed full of baby lettuce that you plant them really close together or you direct sow them and it's just this like hedge of lettuce and you're just really excited to go cut, cut them and make a big salad of baby lettuce greens it's really great especially in the spring and fall but in the winter that bed of lettuce is all packed together you'll get some botrytis or some or some downy mildew or something start to get a hold in there and it'll just burn through the bed and you'll lose half that entire bed just because it it's there's no airflow and that that those diseases just go crazy but if you were to have little lettuce plants spaced six inches or eight inches apart and you just take out the pick the outer leaves kind of a cut and come again method it's a little bit less efficient but like you just take those leaves off and let the plants get a little bit bigger and a little bit more robust and not like a baby green that's like super flimsy. You just keep pulling off a couple leaves every couple days. The new leaves will grow and the old leaves are the ones that are likely to get the disease first. So you're preventing it from multiple ways and you're providing airflow around each plant. So that's like, that's like technique. That's like baking technique versus a recipe alone. It's like there's a lot that could be done and it's, uh, it's kind of fun to experiment with those kinds of things. My technique is not to grow lettuce at all in <laughs> winter. Um, <laughs> that, that six to eight inch spacing for me, it takes up way too much space and it just isn't that much food. One of the reasons um, I f focus so heavily on the Asian greens, this brassica wrapper family, is there's a dimension to them that's almost never uh, commented upon which is the systemic disease resistance throughout all these crop types. It's extraordinary. I plant my greenhouse, my greenhouses in winter look like thickets. I mean, literally hedges of food. Uh, simply because those Asian greens have this uh, extraordinary disease resistance that most of the European crops don't. I mean, also go with um, arugula and spinach in terms of the Europeans. But they tend to be more diseasy, for example. Um, but the Asians are extraordinary. Um, I find tatsoi, tatsoi, choys, mizunas, mispunas, Indian mustards, the jamsias, the Asian mustard, uh, uh, the, uh, the leafy mustard, so There's on and lot, so forth. Lots of options. Lots and lots and lots and lots of options. And you can plant them literally in thickets and harvest off them repeatedly. I should, uh, whilst we're on, I, I don't know if we'll come back to this point, but one of the things I will mention that one of the things that, one of the reasons that the brassica rapids are so uh, distinctive is that typically we grow them in the spring and summer. I mean, what, or typically we grow them in early spring, for example, they come up really fast, extraordinarily vigorous. So you can sow them in cold soils and they come up quick. They do their thing, they bolt, they're done. But sowing them into the winter, typically what you find is that they can, come up with that vigor, and then the cold arrests the bolting process, but they maintain that vigor through the winter. So essentially what you have are these food producing machines that continue to produce a lot of growth, but don't bolt, and you can harvest off them repeatedly. Now, there's a certain harvesting style that really lends itself to the homestead level, for example. I mean, it might be a little more challenging to do it if you were selling into a market. But if you're willing to go into a greenhouse and harvest leaf by leaf, or with a pair of scissors, for example, you can really make it work. Um, winters are really the, uh, are the salad season. And um, those Asian greens in particular, in combination to agree with uh, arugulas and so forth, are extraordinarily productive. One of the challenges can be that, um, for example, a lot of people aren't used to Asian greens. So, for example, if you're putting that type of food into um, a pantry serving poor folk, um, they, they can be turned off by the notion of salad greens. But it just so happens with those Asian greens is that they work spectacularly as stir fries. So I can walk up to someone and say, hey, stir fry. Oh, thank you, they'll say. But they work equally well, raw or cooked. Yeah, so um, everything as far as pests and wet and disease and those kinds of challenges, everything 
will have its breaking point and it might have its nemesis just waiting in the in the shadows. So something like I don't know if I don't think Scores and Era has any nemesis. <laughs> it just does its thing and it doesn't care. But the uh, Brassicas, for example, tend to get very little disease going into winter and through winter. But as a seed grower, I've been, and a lot of growers in the area have been struggling a lot with disease in the springtime when they start to bolt, when, the, when it warms up a little bit and it's like a little bit warmer and rainy. There's these like really bad Brassica diseases, Foma, Xanthomonas, there's a bunch of these things that start to infect the plant in late stage. It's not as much of an important thing to be concerned about as a, as a gardener or a grower, uh, but it is something that's important to know that this weather is very conducive to diseases. And we have to strip leaves, make sure none of the leaves, none of the lesions on the leaves get into the plant and go systemic. We have to hot water treat the seed after we've harvested the seed because a lot of these diseases are seed borne. So there are things to be concerned about at some point for almost every crop. So there's very few things that are like golden all the time. But the point of having top soy and mustard greens going into winter is something that's very reliable. Yeah. I have a question. So uh, w w when is the best time to put the seeds in? Like with your uh, top soy and Indian mustards and bok choy and so forth. Do you put that in like later summer? Because of yeah, oh, so I was looking through my notes uh, last night. September the 15th is a great date for basically just about everything you're going to put into a greenhouse. Um, That's a very specific date. Yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, transplant. One of the things that makes um, um, greenhouse growing one of the more exciting and problematic adventures in the entire agricultural calendar is essentially that we're sowing into a an environment that's uh, a controlled environment that's intending to keep things warm and dry into a conditions that have always been erratic in terms of late summer Indian summers and heat events and crops that have a particular propensity to bolt if they hit a particular temperature threshold. So you're working with this tension in terms of wanting to get your crops established into a context that can be very powerfully and negatively affected by a heat event. Um, so you're not wanting to see too early because those plants are likely to bolt, and you're not wanting to see too late because those plants won't have a, won't, will have a tendency not to size up in time for the winter. Um, and working that edge and keeping your greenhouse cool and making sure, for example, that you have a irrigation, well, for example, I use drip tape, that I have irrigation ready to go, for example, if a heat event comes in, lends that particular adventure uh, a, a, certainly a particular spice. Uh, but I generally find consistently through the years now, one of the reasons I say September, <laughs> September 15th is because if you're going to go with a day, seed then, and then what I do is I seed, and then I transplant a little later. And that transplanting not only gives you the opportunity to get ground ready, but allows you to keep the plants out of that heat sink until temperature levels have had a chance to decline a little. And brassicas and a lot of these heat sensitive crops, when they're small and just have like four true leaves, they can be surprisingly heat tolerant. You don't want to stress them out too much, but it's the germinating and establishing that's sensitive. And then a bigger plant that's like, in, in the, if you have a larger plant in the summertime, they tend to get really stressed out by the heat. But they can handle a lot and then recover and then provide later in the fall. I like to think about after the solstice, as far as timing is concerned, we could talk about timing for a while. Maybe we could just talk about timing for at this point. Because uh, it, it does relate to the wet, the dark, the cold, and the pests, but it's also after the summer solstice, every week you delay planting is often two weeks later for that crop to mature because there's less daylight, there's a little bit less warmth. Sometimes it warms back up, 
but just the day length can have a huge impact on how fast crops size up. So days to maturity and catalogs and planting dates are often guidelines that are not always very accurate. So one of the ways we get around this ourselves is, let's say, mustard greens, the brassica juncea. It says on this sheet to plant them in August. Nick said maybe plant them in September. So there's different, like, if you're not sure how warm this September or, or October is going to be, like last October was great for us, but we didn't know it was gonna be great. So having like three or four rotations or succession sowings, instead of having everything in this garden bed be one planting, break it up into two or three sections and plant every couple weeks, plant another succession sowing. And you will, often one of those will fail or, or maybe just provide a little bit of food uh, but one of them will be so good that it'll make up for the fact that that one planting wasn't optimal. <laughs> and that's kind of just like hedging your bets. Uh, and that's an important thing to be concerned about. But yeah, it, that, that October weather can have a huge impact on maturity and, and plant size. Yeah, generally, I mean, one of the reasons we're um, seeding in, uh, in the latter part of June, transplanting um, end of July, very beginning of August, as so we get those small transplants into the ground, uh, they grow up through August and they hit a certain photosynthetic threshold, generally in the early part of September, then they take off. Really get themselves established in October and essentially by the first week in November everything's really begun to slow down and stop. So you really, that, what you find, uh, uh, as, as, as Andrew was saying, is that if you're two weeks late, you're two weeks late and further down all, the, the whole way down the line. But okay. you're further than two weeks. Further than two weeks. Because of the, there's not two weeks of daylight. Yeah, because everything's declining. In that sense, it's one of the reasons why seeding into fall and winter is much easier a proposition than it is um, doing it in the spring and summer. You basically have a window to seed and you've got to get it done. And then once that's done, it's over. So I have these two seeding windows, the main seeding window for the field crops, and then I stop for two weeks, and then I have my other window for the greenhouse crops. And I generally do most of my seeding over the course of a week or two weeks in late June, and then a week or two weeks later on. And it's the timing conundrum is different for everyone. Uh, your greenhouse, if you're sowing in a greenhouse or in like a, on like some tables that you have like a shade cloth on, everyone's situation and, and equipment is different. So we had a greenhouse that had no fan in it for eight years. And so we thought it, would, it got really hot. It would get up to 105 and then all the way back down to 50 and it was all over the place and the plants were really stressed out. So it took these, the seedlings longer to mature we put, a, we put a fan in there, and when it gets super hot, it drops down, and so it doesn't get over 90, let's say. Everything sizes up real fast on us, so we have to change all of our records and be like, oh, we should plant that on a different week because it's actually happier now. So it's all, everyone's different, and their, their garden's different, their, their microclimate's different, their propagation setup is different, so keep records is, is really the lesson. Um, write down what you did, and reference it next year, and, and maybe take notes during the season if like, oh, this didn't quite work out, this crop was really small. What I like to do if I'm like in a, hu or in a hurry, I'll be like, I'll go past a crop that just for some reason isn't doing well, let's say it's like a kale planting or a mustard planting that never sized up, I'll take a photo of it and move on. And I'll remember later next year, oh, what, what was wrong with that kale planting? And I'll look at my photo and it'll be like, oh, on September, 20th it was way too small and like oh because the timestamp on your photo it's like half the information is there and you can deduce what you did wrong but like take notes keep records share records with your friends but also know that everyone else's records are like inspiration not recipe yes you have space. yeah Excellent question. Um, so I generally start talking to people about winter cropping in early spring. Uh, one of my mantras is, if you're going to be feeding yourself through winter, you want to have ground available to 
transplant, for example, in early August. And one of the reasons I say transplant is, I said, just as I was saying a little earlier, that I seed and then transplant into the greenhouses, is because that window you have to work with with transplanting gives you another four or five weeks time to uh, a either get a prior crop out of the way or and, and or be prepared soil. But the, for the most part, there are some crops you can squeeze off before you uh, uh, transplant your winter crops, for example, I mean, potatoes or getting your garlic out and so on and so forth. But for the most part, you're needing to think in advance about where you're going to put your winter crops. It's one of the reasons, interestingly, that um, once you start feeding yourself year-round, um, your need for space can increase quite significantly. Uh, not just in terms of the space for crops, but the space for resting soil and for feeding soil. And once you get into raising and saving seed, for example, those demands can, can, can go even further. But in part, it's part of the magic of the adventure of really, um, once you begin feeding yourself year-round, you'll really get called into a sense, a deeper sense of belonging in terms of how you manage and how you relate and how you, and how you care for your soils. Um, I'm sure I'm not the first person who got into winter cropping and found that within two or three years I'd exhausted my soils because I was constantly pushing them as soon as a summer crop came out, a winter crop was going in, as soon as a winter crop came out, a summer crop was going in, and so on and so forth. So there is a need to respond um, with reverence. Uh, you really need to sort of almost, you call to step up into a greater degree of reverence in terms of one's approach to stewarding soils. Otherwise, you can shoot yourself in the foot pretty quickly. There's also a like lessons that you learn from other people's mistakes or successes. Like in uh, in Northern California, um, there's a farm that does some no-till year-round plantings that they just they pull out the, they cut off the old plants and plant new ones, and they constantly have stuff growing. But it's because they have constant growing conditions where like there's photosynthesizing happening, it's feeding the soil, everything's alive and active all the time, and because of that, their soils are improving a lot because there's like the plants are giving back to the soil and growing. And but here in Oregon, at some point in the in the winter, it's too cold and the soil is asleep, so you can't like force it to wake up necessarily. Um, and also, it gets so wet that it kind of squishes. There's a certain point in the winter where it's like, oh, everything's every it's so wet out there, and then like in January, you're like. Wait a minute, my field looks like it's two inches shorter. It's just like it's squeezed out all of the air and uh, filled with water, and it's just this heavy stuff. And like oftentimes that contributes to the soil being a little bit sad that might need. So some people have had success with no till here, but it's really hard to get that air into the soil reliably, especially in the springtime when the plants really want it. And it's the most compacted and the most like anaerobic so like there's a, so you can learn from different ways of doing it and apply certain things and figure out what works for you uh, it's it's very experimental and it's fun to find things that work uh, I think there can be a tendency as well for those of us who work at the small scale to simply throw more compost at a problem um, <laughs> what I what I found um, ultimately is that is 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 that is that's faking it it doesn't ultimately work. What I found that the only thing that really allows me to consistently crop year round is to throw a cover cropping regimen into the mix. And that works really, really well. And not having it doesn't work well at all over the medium term. I, I beg your pardon, a cover cropping regimen. So sowing, you know, a typical mix of resting ground or feeding ground. Um, and as I said, it, I was talking a little bit about reverence. I mean, what it requires is not being as ambitious as you might be. It requires a certain degree of humility with regard to stewarding your soils. It means, it means caring for your soils rather than simply endeavouring to haul vegetables out of them as much as you otherwise might. It's really fascinating how Nick was saying it. It teaches you like a humility and a reverence when you're working with these and a patience 
but also at the same time it teaches you like engineering brain so it's really crossing some wires and you get really confused and kind of lost but because you have to be like in this a state of like sublime like experience and then you're like what exactly what date was that what did i put on the so it's like like what should i rotate it's it's a, it's a really it's fun to exist in all of these planes and i like like so for our example with on the farm we have crop zones uh, we we probably crop on four or five acres we don't always plant this is for the seed production so it's quite large but we plant like quarter acre zones or third acre zones and they're like irrigation zones so it's, it's kind of like so it's, it gets you get the, the engineering brain like what's the hardest thing to change that you have to just deal with and work through is i can't get different irrigation they're 14 beds wide or 12 beds wide like that's my rotation zone my block that i have to deal with so we plant maybe six beds of overwintering seed crops like brassicas and let, um, celery beets or whatever is it's being planted and then the, the second half of that zone we can get into we leave it open or like put some plastic on it or put some uh, we, a winter kill cover crop or something on it so we can get into that in the early spring so our overwintering zone is also our early spring zone and then those the overwintering crops because we're harvesting the seed we pull that off in July or later and the, and the early spring stuff, maybe we're pulling that off in July or August. So we have enough time to maybe get in like a buckwheat summer cover crop or get in some early winter cover crop and get that zone finished off and ready to be like safe over winter and it does not produce another winter crop that next year. Because producing winter crops on winter crops on winter crops is really where you get into trouble. And you'll start to see the soil just gets like, it's not as crumbly, it's a little bit more clay or what it just doesn't like it um, because it's, it's, it takes a lot um, but then we'll have our beans and corn somewhere else we'll have our squash somewhere else in a different zone and our, we'll have a summer mi miscellaneous veg zone with our tomatoes and peppers and stuff so we we've been rotating these like larger rotational zones which isn't like a exactly crop rotating but it's rotating in order to manage the health of the soil and also it's, it's kind of time-based in, in a way like what is there when if we were to put uh, winter squash in the middle or right next to our cabbage and that was in the same zone we'll have a half a zone that won't be able to easily be cover cropped in the fall because the squash is still out there and the, but then we'll want to cover crop half of it so it gets kind of like mixed up and hard to deal with so finding ways to simplify like on in your in your space is, is really important and and, and, and I think coming back to your question, which is essentially probably a question about limited space, um, one of the things we try to encourage people to do is to focus on, uh, on prioritizing crop choices. We've spoken a little bit about um, overwintering cauliflowers. Now, an overwintered cauliflower that's been in the ground for a year is almost considered like the high point of the winter season. I mean, it's spectacular eating. And it's basically been out in all the elements for months and months and months. And all that juju is in that food, and they are extraordinary experiences. It tastes completely different than summer cauliflower. Yeah. It tastes like a giant, like somewhere between a macadamia nut and a cashew. But it's really, incredibly it's, good. It's extraordinary. But cauliflowers are perhaps the most uh, vulnerable of all the major brassicas. They're also huge. They have this extraordinarily broad habit. You can three. see three of them on this, in this table. And that's tight spacing. I mean, they're huge. So they've got the vulnerability. You've got the space. You've got all the time there in the field. So, uh, and then they have some, um, they're fussier with their fertility requirements than some other crops, for example. They're, and you certainly don't want to stress them as, as, uh, as transplants at all in the flats or anything like that. So. Th we would recommend, I'd recommend that you only really start getting into those overwintering cauliflowers. If you have the space, if it's the luxury item, 
Um, thank you. Beg your local organic farmer to plant some. Yeah. And guarantee that you'll buy as much as you can. <laughs> and just keep pestering them to plant more yeah. overwintering cauliflower. Yeah, cauliflower is very, overwintering cauliflower is very, probably one of the most threatened of all food crops. We might actually lose them. Um, a complicated story. Um, the, um, uh, and then there's that, s that, that spectrum of crops all the way from the most sort of vulnerable crops at, at, at the far end all the way to the hardiest of crops and the most productive of crops. So one of the reasons we recommend um, kales and commons, for example, is that they have this very economical space habit. They're very upright, for example. You can harvest off them repeatedly. They're far more forgiving with fertility requirements than a lot of other crops. I mean, if your fertility regimen isn't that hot, you're still going to get some chaos at the end of the day. And then we've got a lot of diversity, as, as we were mentioning, within those crop types, particularly in this bioregion, as we've, we've done so much work with them. So a heavy focus on leaf brassicas um, is, is wise in, in many ways. And then we've got the maturity spectrums in there too, you know, the stuff that's really fantastic midwinter, and then the kale varieties that have been bred and selected through the decades and centuries to really come on strong at the end of the season, when they produce an enormous amount of food and side food action, or rab, as we call it when we sell it to hoity-toity chefs in Portland. <laughs> It's fun to it's fun to think about these kales that for example of how like like you just you get you build a relationship with the variety and you start noticing things. It's like how did I not notice that? That's really strange. So one of the things I noticed with uh, we have a kale that we got in at Heritage Seed Library in the UK called Russian Hunger Gap Kale. And it's like not the most vigorous kale, but it's pretty good. It grows really well. It looks like just like a red Russian kale, but it keeps producing leaf, medium, strong vigor all winter long, whereas other kales just kind of like take a break. And then in the hunger gap, which is in the name, it just goes crazy. And it just starts producing, but it, but it waits two, three weeks late to bolt later than all the other Napa scales that look identical. So it's somebody at some point selected the hunger gap kale to fill the hunger gap. And in order to do that, most of your other kales have like, you're eating kale rob at that point. You're not eating kale stem and leaf anymore. It's like, so there's different varieties that almost look identical that have a different backstory and different characteristics. We figured that one out pretty quick. But one time I was growing uh, white Russian kale, which is a fantastic variety from Frank Morton and out in Fulhamath, Oregon. He bred it, it um, mostly on wild, uh, uh, at a gathering together farm where, and it's just like, a, it's a white vein Russian kale. It's really pretty, kind of different than the red Russian kale. It tastes great, very vigorous, especially in the fall, but then it just completely shuts down all winter long. It's like, it goes dormant. It's like, I got really annoyed the first time I grew it because I was growing it for winter CSA. I'm like, this isn't producing any leaves anymore. It's just sitting there. And then in the springtime, a little bit, not in the hunger gap, but right before the hunger gap, it just went crazy again. And it like tripled in size and just produced boxes of kale in April or uh, a little bit earlier than that. So it was just, it was a weird behavior. And I thought, why is this happening? Why is this kale doing this? And I remembered that Gathering Together Farm is right on the Mary's River, and almost every year it floods. And any plant that is like metabolizing and alive and like pulling stuff out of the soil and just get, like I'm, I love the cold weather. This is great. And you get a foot of water on that plant, it's probably gonna suffocate and be like, ah, I, don't, I'm, I, I didn't, wasn't expecting that. I'm just gonna die. And so they selected for plants that could handle being flooded for a couple days. And the ones that survived are the ones they produce seed of. So the side effect of that is this kale tolerates wet feet and cold, wet ground better than almost any other kale because it was selected in an environment where it was being, the selection event of the flood was, was saying, you need to go dormant and go like almost like fully stasis in the part of the winter when you're likely to get flooded, like in the 
it's like you February or something when it floods, or it's like so like by the time the flood's gone, it's like yeah, I'm going. Like it's like it, it's just like that kale figured it out on its own almost with a little bit of human assistance. And you'll find uh, each one of us will have gardens that have uh, specific conditions that specific um, cultivars will will be well suited for. Yes, Jay. So. Growing that seed, though, in a different environment on your farm, isn't it going to change the seed after a number of years because it's not getting those same conditions that it did on the Marion River? Uh, it would slowly uh, ch uh, adapt to a new environment if you're saving the plants that do better in your, in your situation. So in order to maintain that trait long term, you probably want to select for the ones that are more dormant over winter or tolerate wet soil. But he made a cross between a Siberian kale and a Red Russian kale and was selecting out the progeny and the actual, the, so he started a breeding project and bred that variety in that environment. So it is pretty strongly selected for that and only the plants that tolerated it survived. So it's something that is, I would say that that trait is more durable than like an average one-off mutation that can come and go. Uh, it would you could slowly select it away if you're not selecting for that and lose that trait, but it would stick around for a while because it was part of its its lineage for for a long time and its uh, its originating breeding process. So things do adapt slower or faster depending on what you're selecting, depending on the species, depending on if they're self pollinating, cross pollinating. That plant breeding stuff gets really complex and fun really fast. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, that's, that's the, I love that stuff. Yeah, the further in you go, the, the deeper it gets. It's just lovely. But you're right, but I wouldn't worry too much in the short term, is what I'm trying to say. Coming uh, back to that question about, in a sense, almost like prioritizing food crops in limited amounts of space, um, uh, leeks, for example. Um, again, a, a, a crop that cooks absolutely love. The, the, one of the interesting aspects of beginning to grow food through winters is that very quickly you move from an approach of what am I going to grow in the winter to what grows well for me. And not only what I'm going to harvest in the garden today is what wants to be harvested from the garden today. And you find these particular crop types reveal themselves as spectacular performers at particular parts of the year, you know, Brussels sprouts in January. Cabbages in February, uh, overwintering broccoli in March and April, overwintering cauliflowers in May, and so on and so forth. These particular characters that really show themselves. One of the things that makes leeks unusual, for example, is that there's no crop that um, produces more nutrient density per square inch than leeks. They're like skyscrapers, for example, very dense, a lot of food in them, and you can start a I'm going to start my winter leeks in March and April, and you can start actually eating them off them in August, and then eat off them September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. The, I don't know if there's any other vegetable crop that has a harvest window quite as that long. They're also incredibly hardy. I mean, they go through anything. So um, I would say if you're going to introduce an allium to the mix, uh, do that. Root crops too. Um, there's a there's an aspect to um, harvesting bright orange carrots and deep blood red beets in the middle of winter. Um, that does a lot for the soul. Never mind the nutritional profile and the medicinal qualities associated with that particular crop type, for example. And as um, Andrew was saying, um, if you're faced with um, threatening soil conditions and worms and oogies that, 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 that can really detract from the quality of those root crops, you can just dig them in January, say, or December, or, or even early, if you like, and um, put them in a Ziploc bag, throw them in the fridge, and they'll store for another three or four months. Um, and having that diversity of colors and crop types in the diet is also something to consider factoring in. So rather than going overboard, say, with um, 
a dizzying array of brass goes. Maybe focus on a beat and a carrot and a leek and Celeriac. a celeriac. <laughs> yes. I love celeriac. I know. I got it's it. one of those things where like a lot of these beets or carrots or celeriac store so well that you don't have to keep them in a cooler or in the refrigerator. You could put them in a bag, like a big like 20 pound bag of carrots, like a with like little perforations so it's a little bit breathable and you can throw it in your woodshed and like two months later they're mostly still good right. um and but as long as it doesn't freeze solid or the rodents don't find them but like it's not as optimal as putting them in a root cellar or a, a cooler but it's you can have months of like definitely in the solstice, winter solstice time you can have just stuff just chilling in your woodshed. It's, yeah, it's I, remarkable, some of these plants. I, I can always remember being really, for example, I mean, uh, many people in Central Europe, that the, the cabbages and carrots and beets, for example, that they're eating in winter, they've dug them all in October and stored them. And that's how they do it. Um, one, one of the reasons we keep food in the ground in the Pacific Northwest is because we can. It's because our ground doesn't freeze. But we've got this option of either digging and storing the whole way through, or digging and storing part of the way through, or not digging at all, depending on how things go. Um, those are options uh, available to us. You don't, I, I think also, I think one of the things that I, I was, um, gave a lot of thought to when I first started winter cropping was the notion that I needed to have a root cellar. A root cellar was critical to storing crops. And I always remember um, uh, running into uh, 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 an elder fruit enthusiast. I said, what was all that about? Just get yourself a tote, throw your apple, you, your apples in Ziploc bags. And rubber made tote. Rubber made tote and stick them under the eaves. That was Nick Botner. Stick them under the eaves on the north side of your house and carry the apples through all weathers, all freezes, and be eating fresh apples in March and April and May, depending on the variety. It was that easy. Um, you, it, it, it's much easier to store food than you might imagine through winters. You don't need structures and technology. And then once you start to, say, for example, bury um, a rubber made tote in the ground, and then cover, you know, up to the level of the lid, and then cover it with some straw, you basically maybe fill it full of sawdust basically got something that works just as well as the most sophisticated root cellar you'll find. Micro root cellar? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not difficult. Don't, don't, don't be intimidated. And give it a go. Okay. What should we talk about next? Um, let's talk about that. We are a little bit more than an hour in, so... What's Celeriac is a uh, root celery, oh. uh, and it's okay. it's a common vegetable in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, and it has a really good potatoy celery flavor to it. And it's often I we usually chop it up and throw it in a stew, or roast it up just like a potato <coughs> or a beet. And it has a unique flavor. It's um, they're not as winter hardy as uh, some leaf celeries. Like if they can only go down to about maybe 20 degrees reliably, but and they often will rot out by the end of winter. And if you leave them out in the field, but sometimes you get lucky, but they do store fairly well. Um, and uh, it is a delicious starchy food that's different than the typical things. So I I, I think I just uh, um, like to touch a little bit into um, varietal choices and why they matter so much. Uh, for example, I tend to think of the winter season, you mentioned that you sort of thought of it as like four separate seasons. I tend to think of it as like three separate seasons. The, uh, uh, the fall reach into the new year, um, the midwinter season, uh, when things are really uh, dark and cold and generally difficult, sort of, a, and then the, the spring season. And typically, we're, we're, um, uh, I, I mentioned that leeks, for example, covers the whole spectrum, but it's unusual in that regard. Broccolis, for example, your typical green calabrese broccoli, 
what we think of as broccoli, will g generally holding that floret up into the winter weather, will typically succumb by December, for example. But there's an entire uh, type of uh, overwintering broccoli called overwintering broccoli, so all what we tend to think of the, the purple sprouting broccoli. Very, very, very different characters that come on in February, March, and April, and so forth. But growing broccoli, I mean, broccoli can be very problematic as a spring crop, for example. There's a great tendency for it to bolt and fussy and so on and so forth. But as a fall crop, it's spectacular. I mean, growing into those cooling weathers, it loves it. And then, of course, it gets all the cooling sweetness coming in on it, too. And then when you throw in, for example, one of the... Um, one of the populations that we circulate in our network is a, what we call a, uh, um, it's a breeding population that was designed by uh, one of the top um, traditional plant breeders at uh, OSU called Jim Myers. It's what we call a broccoli grex. It's this incredibly diverse broccoli population. It has a maturity spectrum of, I mean, a typical hybrid broccoli will have a maturity spectrum of about three days or so, something like that, I think. Maybe something like that. Um, Your maturity spectrum is based on how long will it hold in the field. How long will it hold in the field? Not, uh, not when it starts. Yeah. They all start about the same time. But when you're um, when you're wanting to move a, a, a machine, a, a computer-driven machine that harvests broccoli, or an army of farm laborers into a, a field to harvest broccoli on a particular day, you want all that mature. Or you want single heads of broccoli all mature on one day. Whereas with that Grex, we have a sixty to hundred day maturity spectrum. For example, that works. Now, if you're working at the homestead level, you don't want all your broccoli maturing on the same day. You want it maturing our own uh, uh, incredible spectrum. So we, so we have this ability to take, for example, an open pollinated broccoli grex, grow it into the fall, and essentially have broccoli for months. Then the other side of the winter, we have different forms of broccoli that also have an extended maturity spectrum to a certain day. Though, for example, I'm not as fuss, I'm not as into purple sprouting broccoli as I used to be. I think we've lost a lot of the quality in that crop type. But what you find is that if you are dialed into sprouting uh, the flowering of different, I mean, there can be a tendency to think, oh my goodness, that kale's beginning to bolt early. Well, it's producing incredibly tasty florets early for you too. So you have the kales and your collards that are going off and beginning to flower. And if you're not actually needing to get that to a market, but you're just eating the food yourself at home, you have this extraordinary uh, array of, you can eat plants at different, stage, at different stages of their growth. Once you start rolling, for example, the flowering brassica wrappers, that so once your greenhouse starts to bolt, you're talking about these exquisitely scented and delicate flower buds that lend a beautiful quality to your diet. No one's going to be able to cut them and get them to market because they'll, they won't travel. But if you're growing food at the homestead level, this whole world of harvesting possibilities opens up for you in terms of when you harvest crops, how you harvest crops, and so on and so forth. And uh, paying attention to how these crops grow, besides the, the unique things that you weren't expecting, would be broccoli. There's varieties of broccoli like umqua. If you plant it in early May, it does fine. But if you plant most other hybrid varieties of broccoli, that Umqua is one that was selected by Tim Peters down in uh, uh, Myrtle Creek Riddle area, and he selected it for resisting bolting in the spring. Most broccoli is very sensitive to vernalization. You get like a week of temperatures in like the low 50s and 40s. It will think it went through the winter and it'll start bolting. It's and because most people don't plant it when it's that cold out, and the big plant breeding companies don't care that much because it's all being grown in California. So that umqua broccoli is really special because you can plant it in the spring and get a good harvest off of it compared to other broccolis. Where overwintering broccoli, the, the purple sprouting broccolis, and there's a, there's a nine star white sprouting broccoli, it's pretty weird and sometimes not available to, in the US. But these 
they're very day length sensitive. They're not as vernalizing cold sensitive. So they will wait until the day length, the actual hours of daylight hit a certain point and then they will start flowering. So there's different varieties that will flower in the middle of February and other varieties that will, like the red arrow that we have, that which will start flowering in uh, April and May. So it'll fill the hunger gap. So there's, so you start to notice these little tiny things that you don't need to notice as a summer gardener. Summer gardening, you just plant some lettuce and your tomatoes and hopefully they ripen. And it's like, it's like pretty straightforward. It's not super complicated. Where there's winter stuff, you start dealing with day lengths and latitudes and longitudes, and you're like, there's a whole lot of like, a lot of complexity that, that comes into the fore very quick. And I'm essentially seeding my fall cabbages the same time as I'm seeding my overwintering cabbages. It's just that I'm seeding a variety of cabbage that has a 60-day maturity, as distinct from a 150-day maturity spectrum, for example. So. Um, these varietal choices are very, are very important. Um, so, do you think we've talked too much about brassicas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, um, we, one of the things um, I was hoping that we might actually get to before um, end of business today is actually talking a little bit about seed saving, specifically on brassicas. But until until that point, maybe we can talk about something else. So. Any, any other specific questions or directions people might like us to go in? in the, yes? If you don't have a greenhouse, yeah. you can just pop the seed in, right? And, um, you're talking about propagating, or you're talking about carrying it through the, through the winter? Well, yeah. 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 Um, well, um, I mean, one of the advantages of working with greenhouses or working with transplants, in a sense, is you can make every seed count. Um, and then, as I said, it gives you that extra four or five week window, for example, to get ground ready and so on and so forth. There are manifest advantages from starting seed in the ground. Many farmers do it. It's just not a technique I'm particularly well versed in or practiced or accomplished in. Um, I, I do know a, um, a very experienced uh, um, farmer in, in Washington, I've spoken to about this, who starts all his um, winter brassicas in the ground, then he comes along with a mower and shaves the top off them all and then transplants them out into the field. But you've got to be really dialed in um, to be getting that right. So there are all sorts of different approaches. Just do whatever works for you. Do whatever works for you. As I said, one of the primary reasons I'm raising um, food from transplants, not just because I'm, uh, I, I like every seed to count, but because it gives me weeks more time to prepare ground to get food into. And I typically find that I start my sprint in early spring, and no matter how fast I'm going, I sort of need that time in order to get ground ready to put to put transplants into the ground. Yeah, economically, it's a lot cheaper, I would imagine, yeah. versus going to the, you know, yeah, buying slots. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's but, really extraordinary. But it but it is uh, more expensive than direct sowing. That's definitely, like direct sowing is, if you can get away with it, is the cheapest and simplest way. It, you do have to spend more time preparing the soil well so the plants will get established easy and quick. And also uh, uh, weeding, if you have weed pressure, you have to be really vigilant with your weeds from a, from a direct sown crop. Uh, transplanting, usually you can get away with a little bit cloddier soil and a little bit weedier soil and it's easier to get a good crop off of it that way. But um, I typically think that the expense of growing transplants yourself is usually worthwhile if you can manage it. Um, even if it's something as simple as getting ahead of the symphylins. There's a lot of symphylins in the, in the Willamette Valley which is a, a little arthropod, little creepy crawly that's in the soil that often eats plants and it really can do a lot of damage when they're little tiny sprouts, especially like beets and and uh, carrots. And, yeah, and like the quinopod family is really susceptible to them, like the like uh, spinach and things like that, quinoas and 
four X tends to get you direct sell a lot of those and they just like you have the, your your bed is like oh it's really good and you're like oh what's wrong and oh it's really good again and you pull up a plant and there's all these little little white wormy things all over the root ball and you're like oh but if you transplant that into the soil and the plant's like a good size you often can beat that early pressure and get a crop off not always but that's one of the one of the reasons why we always transplant if we if we can, but we don't transplant things like corn and beans. So there's a, it all depends on the crop. And this uh, uh, and it also certainly presumes a, a certain approach. I mean, for example, you if you start sitting seed, um, your ability to it, it opens up your seeding strategies completely. I mean, you can take a bunch of seed and you can literally throw it out on the ground because you have a vast abundance to work with. Or you can let plants go to seed in your garden and drop seed, for example. Um, there's an incredible degree of organicity that could be involved in setting up a self-sustaining regenerative food system. Then, of course, you find that certain crops drop seed and volunteer more readily than other. You know, your parsley as well go, you red mustard sort of take off and so on and so forth. So there's an enormous diversity of seeding approaches that can grow out of personal tastes and personal choices about how you want to take it, yeah. Well, I have a question specifically about carrots. Are yeah. you not direct, you're transplanting carrots, you're germinating in a bed and then transplanting? No, car carrots are one crop that we always direct so. Yeah. But they can they can get hit by some violence, but we still have to direct some. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, like many gardeners, I tried growing carrots to transplanting. I did it one year, and I never did it again. <laughs> if, if you like little stubby L-shaped carrots, it works really great. Yeah. And you gotta see, you gotta see, you gotta see a lot of carrots, but not much real estate. Yeah. Not tell you about me. Uh, when you transplant, do you remove some of the lower leaves of your brassicas? Um. A general rule, no, uh, no, no, I don't. I mean, an exception in California because um, I, I was really trying to reduce the um, the load on the plant as I was putting them into the ground. But for the most part, no, I'm just popping transplants straight in the ground. I mean, there can be a tendency sometimes. I mean, you know, certain concerns rise through the years. You'll hear them um, coming up. You know, sometimes people say you don't really want to be transplanting into incredibly hot conditions. But generally, if a plant's in the ground and it's well watered, it's much happier there than it is anywhere else. Yeah, so like well watered is the key. Yeah. Even if it's 100 degrees out and it has really good water around the, the like feeder roots, yeah. it will probably be OK. Yeah. It's when it gets dry and hot is when plants just, once they wilt, they don't recover. And I might have, um, I mean, we might begin to see extreme summer weather events here. In, in California, for example, when I was establishing, establishing cropping systems into the Sierra Nevada, I would have, I would get shade cloth over all my beds and have shade cloth and irrigation set up before I put the transplants on the ground. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I'm not even talking about pulling the shade cloth back, putting, putting the plants in there and putting shade cloth over. I mean, really, you, you, I mean, if you work with it, you can work with extraordinarily difficult and challenging conditions. Part of the goal of all of this is to figure out what you can get away with and then do things to fix problems. Because fixing problems that you don't have yet is a great way to be a little too paranoid. It's important to like, if you don't need the shade cloth, don't use it. But if you realize you need it, you're gonna wanna plan for it. It's, it's a, uh, I like to stress out plants a little bit and see, to, just to see how, if they can rise to the occasion. And if they can, I know that that's a, a, a resilient, strong crop type that I can rely on. And I uh, learn from, plants not being pampered more than I learned from plants being pampered. Yeah, and I'd, I'd qualify that. I remember relatively early in my winter cropping experience, and either was a very hard weather event coming in, and I thought, oh yes, this will be an interesting selection event. I'll see which plants do well. And the weather event came in, and it totally annihilated absolutely everything in the garden. So uh, you want to qualify your adventurism with a certain... Yeah. <laughs>
practicality. I mean, essentially what we're trying to do is stack the odds in our favor as much as we can. I mean, I've been talking a lot about getting these plants seeded uh, the last couple of weeks in June. That's because I have a whole bunch of experience relating to stacking the odds in my favor. And I like to get my plants sized up as fully as I can going into the winter. I remember some years ago we had maybe the wettest, it was the driest year on record and the wettest September on record. And September is generally when a lot of your brassicas, for example, are really putting on size. They've, they've reached that photosynthetic threshold, they have the impetus, and off they go. In came the rain. I didn't have a single heading brassica that, 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 that did anything that winter. But I had my kales up and running, for example, so I was, I was fine. I was able to sort of eat off my kales and so on and so forth. But generally, you're trying to allow for the fact that there is going to be some unpredictability in the process, whether it's heavy aphid infestation or a major flea beetle infestation or really cloudy weather for a month or crazy heat or fire, fires and smoke really slowing things down and so on and so forth. Um, it's remarkable how fall smoky weather can slow down the sizing up of plants. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we found specifically in, in our chicories and the DTOs. It was, that's like their perfect point where they want to be sizing up and it was just like, oh, everything's half sized this year. Yeah. And those, you know, those, that it, I mean, you, I remember speaking to John Sunquist, a local farmer recently passed, uh, God bless him, who, um, was one of the original sort of founding fathers of the organic farming movement in this neck of the world 40 years ago. He used to say, we never used to have any disease issues or any pest issues in the old days at all. Raising food is getting harder to do all the time. Um, it's the immunological health of, uh, uh, of our local ecosystems as well the earth is uh, powerfully compromised. And these challenges are, are, are something that we increasingly need to, to deal with. I would say in that regard is that if you're confronted by a disease or a pest issue, for example, and many of us are, constantly are, don't wait in the hope that it's going to get better. Move on it. You'll generally find <laughs> through the years, as if you have experience with it, that it really pays to move on stuff. And very often when you're confronted with a pest issue or a disease issue, it's confusing. You don't know what's going on and you don't know what to do. So there's a natural, can be a natural tendency to wait and see. Don't wait and see. Move on it. If you're going to find an answer, you're going to find it out by moving on it. Yeah. yeah I'm really curious to hear your experience with no-till Um, that's a very complex topic, and um, it's it, it's 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 a it's it's a very common commonly asked question these days. Um, I have little experience with no-till. Um, I'm moving more towards it at the moment, or I might say incorporating it. I'm moving just at this juncture out of an ag more out of an agricultural approach into a horticultural approach. But for the most part, I'm pretty conventional in terms of the way I manage <coughs> weeds and rodents and fertility and so forth. Uh, I use I use a tiller commonly. Um, I don't have the experience to speak to the value of no till, truthfully. We've had a few of our customers and friends have some success with no-till, but it really depends on what kind of no-till it is. There's so many different variants, and what people mean by no-till may involve some small amount of tillage. And uh, a lot of people often have some success for a while, but then have to renovate beds and do some broad forking and remulch it every two years. So it's like, it, there, it, there is a complexity there that I don't have enough experience to reduce to an easy soundbite, but it, it is uh, possible but challenging and a 
a lot of people have tried it and just said, nah, I'll just do reduced tillage. <laughs> because partly it's the oxygen in the soil and partly it's the fertility management and sometimes it's perennial weeds become a problem. So it's, there's a lot of challenges that are overcomeable, but whether or not it's worth it to different people is very, it's very dependent on the person. And it depends on the, on the scale you're working at. Typically at the moment, for example, is I uh, work with a broad fork, a tiller, and I get the soil worked out my first season. And then next year I'm generally just doing stuff by hand, with the digging forks and so on and so forth. <coughs> that said, if I'm raising food at scale, at that point, I tend to involve more in the weighing machines. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, there's a Wild Garden Seeds, uh, Frank Morton, his recent catalog that just came out, has a really great article in there about um, like reduced tillage or minimal till, and it's inspiring how he's like, he, he's a very good writer, but it's funny how like over the years he's figured out how to do reduced tillage, but also like this like skim tilling where you just till the surface of the soil and you don't disturb the like fluffy soil underneath and to avoid hard pans but enough to fluff it up on the top to get the plants established and so there's like and it was really inspirational to me because he deals with a lot of the same struggles that we deal with as seed growers and our wet winter soils and um, I recommend checking his I think it's probably on his website Wild Garden Seeds. I think there can be a tendency for us all to become fundamentalists in terms of our approaches um, I'd say give it give it a go and see give it a go and see what works for you um, okay I, I I did want us to get briefly into the topic of seed saving um, and the, the reason reason for, for that is um, when we first began exploring winter cropping in earnest in our bioregion about 20 to 25 years ago, um, one of the challenges we ran into immediately was the uh, very distinct lack of uh, winter hardy varieties that were available. Uh, complicated by the fact that most, if not uh, uh, all of them, really were coming out of Europe. I remember even as little as maybe 15, 20 years ago, speaking to the head of brassica breeding at Monsanto and asking him whether he was doing any, uh, whether the company was doing any breeding work in cold hardiness. And he said uh, there was absolutely none being done here. I think he had a, a cauliflower that they were working on in Italy, and that was about it. There's basically been almost no conventional work done. Um, for winter hardiness and food crops in the United States for 40 to 50 years at this point. So we have this challenge in the sense that A, a lot of the material existed in Europe and we couldn't get hold of it, and B, what material we could get hold of uh, comes out of the uh, scientific agricultural breeding complex, uh, for the most part, hybrid material. What we've seen in the years since is for, uh, we've had our successes, leaf massacres, we're, we're probably the southern Willamette Valley, maybe leads the world at this point in terms of the diversity and quality of leaf brassicas we have available. But in terms of the heading brassicas, you know, cabbages and cauliflowers and so on and so forth, we've seen, uh, 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 we were sounding the alarm about uh, potential losses 20 years ago. And those losses have only continued. Uh, the, uh, the loss of diversity available to us is uh, catastrophic, really. Uh, complicated by the fact that <coughs> some crops, as you know, are relatively easy to save seed on, the selfing crops, the lettuces, and so on and so forth. You can isolate them and, and breed um, uh, uh, save seed that uh, breeds true. Brassic is uh, a, a little more, a bit more problematic. We need, generally tend to need large population sizes and they need to be isolated. And typically at the level that we're working at and the uh, level that um, 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 Andrew and other independent plant breeders are working at, it can be challenging to find um, people and land uh, that allows us to grow these populations out and uh, secure them as working varieties as we move forward. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to do to try and secure an ability to continue with the regenerative food system that's in overhead is to do more to save seed and to coordinate saving seed uh, among ourselves. Uh, broccoli, for example, 
classic example, the vast majority of broccolis that are available, that are grown by the scientific agricultural complex are um, what we call cytoplasmic monsterity hybrids. They are uh, GMOs. Um, whether or not... Well, they're not technically GMOs in the United States, but they are technically GMOs in Europe. Yeah, one of the things to sort of keep in mind is, that, term, is that the term non-GMO doesn't actually mean non-GMO. It never has. It just simply means that uh, GMO <coughs> contamination, to use a pejorative term, the word hasn't crossed a particular qualitative or qualitative threshold, whether in terms of a certain percentage contamination of a particular seed crop or uh, a particular uh, qualitative aspect of uh, a, a plant breeding genome. So, for example... Can, can I give like a little quick... Yeah, sure. So, Nick was talking about cytoplasmic male sterility in hybrid brassica seeds, which, to be short, is they breed a, a line... One of the parents is male sterile and does not produce pollen, and one that does produce pollen. And that's how they make the hybrid easily, is they plant two rows. One of the parents producing the pollen, and the other one where you save the seed off of the mother plant. And in order to achieve that male sterility, they've uh, engineered the cytoplasm of an embryo in order to have this, the, the area around the nucleus be a different um, plant species than the nucleus of the, bro the broccoli, for example. And they fuse it back together, that's why it's called cell fusion. And that's how, and it's such like a broken biological thing that the plant doesn't produce pollen. And that's how they created a tool to create hybrid seed. And it's just an industrial technique that is very common. And the problem with it, though, is beyond the fact that it's a little bit repulsive, is that it means that if you were to save seed on that hybrid broccoli, it won't produce pollen either. So you have to bring in a pollen-producing parent each time to make a new cross. And that means that any of the genes that are in the, the, the mother line, the, that line cannot be removed out of that gene pool and used in other plant breeding because it's stuck in that side of the, of the it's in that parent. So it's a way for a, a company like Monsanto, Syngenta, or Cicada to create these new hybrids that none of their competitors can get that heat resistant gene out of. It's like stuck in that parent line. And even if they dehybridize it and cross a bunch of stuff to it, you can never restore that fertility to get those genes out. So it's like a proprietary mechanism more than it is like a convenience. So it's really complicated and annoying, and it means that we can't just take seed that we buy that's a hybrid necessarily and save seed on it and create a plant breeding project is what we used to do. We used to save seed off of Arcadia uh, broccoli, and it was not CMS, so it would just spit out a whole bunch of crazy broccolis the next year like a like a hybrid puppy. Like every puppy's different in the litter because the, the parents were so different. But you, you can save seed and create something new. Now with this new s system, you can't actually save seed easily and create anything new from them. It is a, it's kind of like a, a half terminator gene. It's terminator technology. Um, 50% terminated 50% terminated technology, but officially it's not a form of genetic engineering. In fact, if you go to the websites of all of these seed breeding companies who are involved, many of them will actually explicitly state that they're not involved in genetic engineering of such vegetable varieties, because this is not a technique that politically qualifies as genetic engineering in the United States of America. It's not recombinant, like like gene gun editing, it's not CRISPR editing, yeah. so it doesn't qualify. So, but whether, the point is, is that whether or not you find such disingenuousness obscene and unethical doesn't really matter in terms of what we're talking about, about stewarding crops that have the inherent capacity to adapt, to adapt regeneratively and provide the basis of a local food system. So, d did you have something to say, Marjorie? I just have a question. Does that mean that, um, that if it has that gene, it doesn't even go to seed at all? Like, it just doesn't have seeds? It would make seeds if you bring in pollen from a parent. Okay, it's so just you have to do that. You have to make a hybrid every single time in order to oh, save okay. seeds. So you could never have 
a true open pollinated selection from it, and you can own like you can't actually take that mother plant and contribute those genes to the different line of broccoli that you want. You can't actually you have to it stays in that in that channel, and it's yeah. So you bring pollen in and you. You get seed from that, but then you, when you grow that out, you have to. It's a new. Again, it's a new F1 hybrid, yeah. And then, so let's say you have an open pollinated <coughs> variety of brassica, and the wind brings in one of those hybrid pollens. Will it cause that to have that gene? No, that's the. Tr that's why they like it because it means that only they have that side okay. of the genome. Okay. It's not like Percy Smizer and all of the Roundup Ready stuff crossing into everyone else's stuff. It's different than that, but it's but that it, that benefits the corporation to have it be that way. Yeah, and essentially, what it means is that um, all these traits that are being developed by contemporary plant breeders, for the most part, are being locked up in a way that none of us have access to. The only reliable way through is to begin stewarding and developing these crops ourselves. That's one of the reasons, for example, the Agrarian Sharing Network has been so active of late in trying to support the advent of a seed increase network. We're endeavoring to support folk with information, with intelligence, with genetics, with seed, and with plants that uh, provide the opportunity for folks such as ourselves to engage in actually uh, supporting the increase of crops and cultiv oh, I should say of cultivars of specific crop types that we know have the inherent capacity to adapt and to reproduce. Um, if you're interested in that, please uh, do get in touch with us. You can get in touch with the Agrarian Sharing Network through our agrariansharing.net forward slash seed website, or you can email me at agrarian at, at seed at agrariansharing.net. We've been endeavoring to um, support community-based seed increases and in seed grants and seed stewardship. We've been involved in it. We started doing it 20 years ago, isn't it, when he was toddling around Eugene and so on and so forth. Um, but essentially, we've reached the point now where Did you we say toddling around toddling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was a toddler. But uh, essentially, we've 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 we've, we've we're, we're reaching a threshold where essentially GMO creep into our food systems is has 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 reached a level where our capacity to really honestly make an effective go of it over the years ahead is crumbling along with our, <laughs> along with our with climates and ecosystems. There's really a need for us to step up together and begin stewarding these crops uh, at a community level. If we are going to have sustainable winter cropping systems, we are going to need to be stewarding the cultivars and varieties that make it possible for us to make that happen. It's as simple as that. I don't always uh, focus on the GMO, like, kind of scare part of it, because I think of it more as, like, the GMO is just the tool they use to achieve a corporate control over seed. Like, they, if it wasn't GMO, it'd be something else. It'd be a legal, like, contract or something else that they would use to maintain their control over the genes and for, to keep it from their competitors, to keep it from us. Um, but GM, the GMO part is also kind of um, a problem as well. Uh, the Open Source Seed Initiative started uh, years ago to release new varieties that are bred by independent small scale or independent large scale plant breeders that want to pledge their seeds open source so it is like a gift back to the public domain and the community so it's no longer able to be taken by a corporation and bottled up in one of their control proprietary mechanisms and preventing anyone from having access to it for future plant breeding projects and our future resilience as a food system. So the Open Source Seed Initiative has a bunch of cool varieties on their website that are pledged open source, but the best real way to prevent the total consolidation of seed control 
is to grow your own seeds and save your own seeds and make crosses and become a small scale or large scale plant reader. It's really fun. It's really beautiful. It's delightful. Like even if it's like my job, I, it's, it's really stressful and it's a whole lot of work. But if, even if it was like some weird socialist paradise where I didn't need to pay bills, I would still probably be doing what I'm doing because it's beautiful and fun and like it's good work that's improving access and and seed resilience to the large scale people. I don't think I can add any more to that. Resilience and resistance to the amount of time. Yes, uh, yeah. uh, you have you mentioned that uh, saving seeds for Nebraska is, is problematic. Yeah. Um, did you mean in technique? So maybe you want to touch on that. Uh, very simply, uh, I mean, uh, um, maybe you'll have something more to say about this, Andrew, but essentially one of the things we need to do is we need to isolate a particular crop. The challenge with the brass clover racing is essentially is, is, that, is that your cabbages, your European kales, your corn rabbits, your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli, your cauliflowers are all going to cross with one another. It's one of the challenges we have uh, in the sense that there is such an incredibly diverse array of crop types that all have it, that will all essentially cross. The other challenge, so isolating a particular cross if you've got any of those other plants going to flower is, cha is challenging. The other challenge we have is that there's a general need to get the population sizes up. It's not as though you can save seed off one or two broccoli plants and secure the future of that plant. It simply doesn't work that way. Brassicas have a they're sensitive to inbreeding depression. So the more you inbreed them, the more like deleterious genes start to pop up in the population, and you start to get something that you don't actually want to continue on. You want, but if you have a 50 to 100 to 200 plants, you can select for really good quality and keep the genetic diversity within the population going to maintain quality in perpetuity. And if you're a large industrial seed company, you have the money and the resources to essentially separate these grants. I mean, these are people who are growing in both hemispheres every year, so they can double things up and growing in entirely different countries, never mind in entirely different fields. When it comes to small scale bioregional seed stewardship, we're confronted by the reality that there are very few people actually doing it. So what we're needing to do is to simply get more people involved doing it. That's our best beginning and approach. The challenge we have is I think is a lot of people are intimidated by the prospect of growing seed, but it's not as though there's um, anybody else waiting in the wings. You know, as the Hopi adage goes, we're the ones we're waiting for, and we're going to work out how to do it by doing it. And so generally, brassicas, Nebraska Oleraceae needs uh, a quarter mile to a half mile, depending on how much trees or hills or buildings are in the way. Usually it's like a half mile to be perfectly safe uh, between different varieties of the same species. And there are lists where you can see what species, what variety is. Russian kale is Nebraska napis. Lacinato kale is Nebraska Oleraceae, for example. They don't really cross. You can grow them right next to each other, it's fine. Um, but you can, so a cabbage and a kohlrabi and a cauliflower all need to be separated by close to a half mile. And the population, because they're so easy to cross pollinate with bees, it's, 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 it kind of goes with the population size. They want, they're trying to cross pollinate is like their goal. So you probably want to let them cross pollinate because they've evolved to do that. Otherwise, you get inbreeding depression. So, Popular, like if you have 50 excellent plants, you can get away with that no problem, maybe 40. Um, but if there's one bad actor that's an off type or just like really not what you want in there, it will contribute enough genes that you don't want back into the population that you'll have a bad quality crop. The, when you see isolation or population sizes of over 200 plants, that's more of a farm scale thing where just in case there's a bad plant in there, it won't ruin the entire group. It'll be diluted. It's like a little. It's like a little bit of a safety mechanism in there. So um, you start. It's a, 
seed saving is kind of plant breeding light, if you think about it that way. But you could grow like lettuce seed is super easy, parsley, celery seed. Leek, generally you know, not. Yeah, there's some things on your scale and a garden scale that you could easily grow a lot of seed. Yeah. And Russian kale and rutabagas are actually surprisingly okay at self-pollinating and don't suffer that much from inbreeding depression, uh, in contrary to most other brassicas. So you can have 10 kale plants and save seed on them, and that seed will be pretty good. Yeah. I mean, of the Russian kales. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a, important to keep in mind that in the sense that um, Russian kale is a very easy crop to save seed on. Typically, because it doesn't, they're not dealing with much in the way of pollen competition. But because of that, they're not as threatened. Yeah. You had a question? Well, I have a question. I have noticed something about a handout. Can you please speak to how we could get the handout online? Yes, of course. Uh, two ways to get it. One is to go to agrarian-sharing.net forward slash seed, and you'll find it there. And then it's also on the seedambassadors.org. There's a menu item there. You can find Winter Gardening Guide. Yeah. And then if you have specific questions about winter cropping, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, uh, many of us have been putting a lot of information up online through the years. Um, and whether it involves things like building a greenhouse or building a cloche or heating a greenhouse through a winter. We have all these um, little uh, tricks and uh, terms that we've learned through the years. And one of the an important thing, for example, is that if you're using propane heat to heat a greenhouse with, don't replace your propane tank by going to your local propane store and simply swapping a tank out. It's only like half to two thirds full. You'll only get a five hour burn out of it instead of an 11 hour burn if you go to your local propane supplier and get it filled yourself. Now, getting yourself out of bed at two in the morning to swap a propane tank is a lot harder than having a propane tank that'll carry you through to seven in the morning on a bitterly cold night. So little things like that, uh, you don't need to invent the wheel. A lot of it has been making those discoveries and mistakes ahead of you. I wanted to mention that there's uh, some winter gardening charts, a different kind of chart where it's like a sewing charts that I found over the years. Here's three of them examples. They're not, they're guidelines. They're not like exactly, if you follow this, you'll probably be okay, but it might not be exactly right for your location. But Territorial Seed Company has a winter gardening chart which has planting dates and harvest dates and whether or not things need uh, greenhouses. Uh, West Coast Seeds up in BC is a great resource. They even have some of the old territorial varieties that Steve Solomon brought from uh, from the UK. They're kind of like the Canadian version. Of, because they're on the west coast of Canada, they have a similar climate to us as well, with some good reference material for that. And then uh, a little bit more local, the, the log house plants uh, has a, a winter gardening chart that they've produced. A, I don't know if this is accessible on their website or not, but there's uh, different charts like that. And what I like to do is find multiple sources of information and cross-reference them, and then see which is the best recipe, probably make a guess. And we have a small selection of seeds at the back that we brought in. Um, there's a bunch of um, winter leaf transplants. You're yeah, welcome to take as many of them as you'd like. And I also have a bunch of winter gardening books that I, you can check out and just look at. Um, I don't know if they're here at the library, they might be, but uh, otherwise you can take a picture of them or write down the titles and see. Just because good, the more you read about it, the more you kind of like start coming up with your own ideas of what's gonna work for your own situation. I like, I like referencing lots of things. Yes, have you had luck, have green brassicas? I, I saw like a video on YouTube yeah. that the You're talking about the field brassicas, yeah, the big ones. Yeah, yeah a gentleman was in Australia yeah. and he said there's less bugs, less um, crop damage if they're covered. I, you know, I, I don't uh, know how that works here. I haven't, I haven't done it myself simply because um, generally um, 
you grow outside because that's where all the room is. Um, the, the one crop I make a point of putting under cover as well as growing outside is chard. And the reason for that is that we've been talking a little bit about this hunger gap. Chard is very, very unusual as a crop type in the sense that it's, 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 it's almost unique in the sense that it fills a harvest, a two week harvest window in very late spring, almost alone in terms of the meaty greens. All your leafy brassicas have basically gone and the chard basically runs to seed later than just about anything else. And then the style in which it runs to seed, where it puts on a lot of growth and gets really big, means that for about two weeks or so, it's providing food in quantity where nothing else in the spring garden really is. Um, so I will grow it outside. Uh, there's a tendency for it to, to go down. It'll melt sometimes, commonly, for example, in snows. But I'll generally put a few plants under cover in a greenhouse because I know that there's a relative degree of success in terms of getting it through. Like this year, for example, um, it did very splendidly for me in the greenhouse. And for two weeks, I was eating extensively off my charts. But um, the rest of the field brassicas I generally leave outside. Now, there are some interesting um, uh, auditors, for example, Gulag Stars, which is this variety uh, that Andrew carries, that it's almost like a cross between Russia, Siberian, Chaos, and Asian greens to a degree. That's one of the ways I describe it. It's like, well, it technically was. Oh, uh, technically was, yeah. Which, now, now it's more kale than. Yeah, sooner. which is, which is it, it's, it's sort of like a. I, I don't know if you've seen Wild Garden Seeds Russia, Siberian kale population. Extraordinary diversity in terms of leaf shapes and so on and so forth. It's a bit like a miniaturized version of that. And that's spectacular in greenhouses. Um, and then, for example, spinaches. I'll grow spinaches outside, but again, the form of spinach you grow outside tends to be very low grown, prost prostrate. Snow can come in, lay heavy on it, snow will go away, it'll be fine. In the greenhouses, I grow the long, large leafed, uh, fragile stem varieties that produce an enormous amount of food. But if I grew them outside, they'd, go, they'd be crushed by snow. So again, it's a question of particular crop types and then particular types or cultivars within those crop types. But for the most part, I keep the big plants outside. But if we're talking about covering there's multiple kinds of covering plants. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do a lot of row cover, floating row cover. It's a spun polyester that you can get for pennies from like a greenhouse store or a nursery supply store or Peaceful Valley in Albany probably has it now, the new site there. Um, but that we put that on the field partly to get stuff growing faster in the cold weather, partly to keep pests off, and partly if it's gonna be really, really cold and the cabbages might die, Sometimes we'll put two layers out there just for a couple nights mm -hmm. and then pull it back off because it can get pretty pretty damp and swampy underneath the row cover if you leave it on there all winter and you get diseases that way because of reduced airflow. I might I neglected to actually mention something very important. I, mean, talk, I was uh, talking about greenhouses assisting from cloches. Um, I make a very specific point of having material ready to go to protect crops in the field. If I know that a serious weather event is coming in, I cover my crops, I cloche them for the most part. If I haven't got enough material and resources to cloche five beds, I'll cloche the two that I can. I'll save the most important crops I can. Oftentimes, the same structures that I have on my greenhouse tables, I'm taking off my greenhouse tables and putting them into the fields and then covering them with plastic. And I find that that can, can, can lend a very important uh, measure of protection, particularly if I've got, if I also lay floating row cover down and cloche the crops in the fields. Yeah. But it's not something you want to be building at 6 o'clock on a Friday night as you've got heavy weather coming in. You want to have all the pieces in place and ready to go. You really do. So I would like to say that we're, I'm going to have to leave sometime soon. And I would like to share some of the reference material titles just so everyone can maybe, maybe on the live stream or the video or here can write them down.
but also have some seeds to swap. So maybe we should wrap up a little bit and maybe answer some questions on the side if we have time. But uh, one of the, the most uh, important winter gardening handbooks, or two of them, were written by Elliot Coleman up at Maine. It's more of the four season harvest, winter harvest handbook. It's a very like production oriented, Maine greenhouse style. Not exactly what we were talking about today, but very inspiring. Uh, Binda Colebrook up in BC or oh. uh, wrote a, one of the first books on winter gardening in the Pacific Northwest, and it's called Winter Gardening in the Maritime Northwest. And it is uh, a little bit lighter reading, a little bit more garden focused, and but it's really fun and interesting as well. Binda Colebrook. Binda. And I think it might have been written 40 or 50 years ago at this point. Yeah. 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 Um, and then there was a more recent one by Charles Downing in the UK, who's a famous garden writer there, just called Winter Vegetables. And the UK has a similar climate to what we have some of the year. So you can, you can kind of transpose some of those ideas here. He's a very lovely and humble man. <laughs> and there's the classic by uh, Steve Solomon, Growing Vegetables West of the Cascades. It's not all winter gardening stuff, but it's it got a lot of good ideas and thoughts and eccentric little notes about certain ways of growing things. And if you're wanting to get into seed saving for the first time, or you want the joy of cooking of seed saving, this is the, the Seed Garden, which is uh, produced by the uh, Seed Savers Exchange and Organic Seed Alliance together, and it is a wonderful reference book that I reference all the time. There used to be a book called Seed the Seed. This is kind of the version two of that, and it has lots of really beautiful photos in it, so it's just fun just to have around to look at. So that's the, the, the basics of references that I typically reference for, for, for trying to figure stuff out. But. And um, I've extensively documented my experience uh, greenhouse cropping in the last few years. Um, and get in touch with me, and I can always put you in touch with um, a very broad array of videos that don't simply discuss techniques, everything from basic greenhouse construction to heating them to also uh, a lot of information on specific crop types and cultivars within those crop types too. Seed at agrariansharing.net, yeah. yeah. And Nick is my name too, so. Yeah. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks for the good questions. Yeah, that was great. That's pretty that's a pretty that's a pretty geeky applausy audience. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah.